some of the luminaries of climate tech and start off with our friend Terry here who's been in banking and product development for over 35 years. And he's probably one of the few people who can honestly say, I've been at Noble since the very beginning. I'd like to talk about our star here, Tadu, who is the key to the Boston Medal. And I think could be one of the most disruptive and biggest climate innovations out there. He's a bit unique in that a lot of startups get killed entrepreneurs, but there are very few entrepreneurs who can say, my last job was running a $2 billion company in the metaverse. Um, Boston Metal, I think, is one of the most exciting things tackling 10% of our global emissions of transceiving. That's our channel, and what we're going to try to do today is talk about how first of its kind is important, if not essential, for climate solutions. For me, um, I'll, I, I guess I describe myself as a climate OG. I've been in climate for 20, 25 years, and I'm fortunate to have been full place for working at the White House, and now I'm 100% union supporter. Why I think socially is important is because we don't live in the matrix yet. In order for us to truly start solve climate issues, we have to bend to the issues of concrete. Not only do we have to do that, but we have to do that at gigascale. Ever. Having a great new solar panel for labs, fine all, but it only really makes impact if you have more infrastructure. But in order for things to get to gigascale, we have to use first of its kind. That, as many people know, we refer to anything as early as possible. There are the new generation of companies like Boston Metal that are doing first of its kind. They have the chance to be the next Tesla of their industry. I personally believe that there's going to be a Tesla in every industry for this fertilizer, all the things that we Now, we'll start with the rest of the true presentation and have Terry talk a little bit about his experience with first of kind project finance. And after that, we're going to have Tadu talk about Boston um, good morning, everyone. Uh, how many here, ra raise your hand if you, before, do you know what folk is really? It, it, are, you, are you at a place where you've looked at it, you're reading about it, you understand? Just a show of hands of, so literally half the people here understand what this is about. Um, and I'm just curious, raise a hand if you think you're leaving into your first job heading into a get on the front line and do something close like this, first of a kind. How many do you want to be out there? Ra raise your hand. OK. Um, I, I have just one slide to share. Um, and I thought this might, might wrap it. We're going to get into the story of Boston Metal, which is really exciting. And I, and I love the way David introduced it, which is that you've got a person with huge, deep experience coming in what is a really important mission critical thing to do if we're going to save, you know, save the planet on temperature. There's no doubt about it. Um, and, and he'll tell us about that. This, this graph is a bit busy, but you'll see many versions of this. And this is not proprietary in any way, but it basically says um, you got you to finance these projects, these first of a kind. And so the question that most, most early stage investors are going to ask is how are you going to do it? What form of capital? What form of Debt, um, will you get what form of um, grants, you know, other support? Ultimately, though, underneath it all is going to be equity. And of course, we know that equity check gets written first. And so shrewd investors who are coming from a CEO of a, a major in, in company who's deciding whether to take a new job in a startup or early stage equity investors are going to ask the most important question is, you know, does it work and does it work at scale? At what cost? So the does it work part is really challenging. Um, um, it's the most important question. And, and so I'm not an engineer, but I live in a world where everything we do is engineering driven. And, and so I thought what would be useful in, in, in a real fast scan is just to make the point that this is essentially about a technology readiness level certification. When do you know this thing is really going to work? When is it going to work as said? When can you work at, as said at the price? Um, and, and 
you know, we don't need to say a whole lot more about that on the panel broadly because, you know, this sort of is intuitive to all of us. But I thought it might be nice to point to three or four other examples that some of you might be looking at in your, in your, in your career um, that I've seen in my career, and, I, and then we're going to, with Tadu, going to drive down into the specifics. Um, uh, direct air capture, really important, right? There are several examples out there. There's a, a big transaction last year, a billion dollar um, purchase of carbon engineering uh, of what was a science project for 10, 12 years, um, and um, very, very complex idea. Um, um, and you know, ultimately, they had a question about chemistry and about uh, cost of input electricity to be economic. Uh, huge deal. We're involved looking now at a project, uh, another one coming out of all places, Google, Google X, which is uh, the Google engineers looking at how to handle air, air, um, uh, air conditioning systems, and they're saying, why not take the carbon out? You know, those are all about, uh, does it work, does the chemistry work at the scale? And those are the problems that, that have to be demonstrated in, in the scale. Take a battery example. I was discussing with the Leeds team yesterday. Um, Flow batteries, really important for, for the grid. You know, lithium is, we know a lot about lithium. It has its own characteristics, but generally it's a short, dur short duration. If you were going to get into the long duration battery world because you believed it was something that was important, you're going to be solving chemistry problems on the flow of a catalyst across many platelets of, of metal, if it's a zinc flow battery, for example. And the real engineering question is turbidity and flow. You know, people have not yet figured out how to put in a, a catalyst at the top of some massive column and have it flow just the right way across a bunch of platelets, come out the other size, and produce the quantity at scale. Um, the only way you figure that out is to build the first of a kind. Um, we're talking to another really interesting strategy about somebody's got wants to use all the oil platforms out there and put a column of put a column and bubble turbulent water up in, and that turbulent water based on how much turbidity you introduce can drive a hydro turbine on the top. Very, very efficient way to use existing stuff, very low impact. Again, um, the key thing keeping investors back is, gee, um, the more turbidity you can introduce, well, the more lift you get to a water turbine. Again, that's got to be solved, and somebody's got to get the money together to, to, to do that. So I just, I, you know, I wanted to, to, I feel like to this group, you're all well informed. I didn't want to dwell on the obvious, but I wanted to highlight the, the fact that by the time the investors that really matter, um, the ones who are in the A round, B round, that are going to really test the launch of this thing, by the time they're putting that capital to work, um, you've typically reduced a pretty small scientific problem. And I, I think you can share some, some light on that. And at the end of the day, most of the really big ideas get reduced very quickly to a gut check on an idea. That's why it's really important for government funding and other stuff around. So um, I would encourage you to be out in the fringe doing the big new things. I would go out there in your career. I'd definitely be looking for somebody who was seasoned, who had been around the dance, who understood um, how to motivate an instant large capital to get something done. But ultimately, you're never going to know um, you're, when you're betting your time and your career on whether that science works. It would be the toughest decision you ever make. Um, we need the young people to get out there and, and lean into that stuff, the engineers, to do that. Um, and um, the finance people, you know, I think, play an important role in helping to model schedule and look at royalties versus capital costs versus how do you capitalize an in industry. That's all important, too. But when it comes to folk projects, you'll see a lot of skepticism across the spectrum, and it's always coming back to this fundamental issue is, um, will it will it produce at scale? And so um, um, I just wanted to introduce that broad broad concept and in, in a shout out to any of you that are going into that going into that landscape because it's really important. And we get, we got to get that done. So. Story before that on how you came to that. Oh, 
Very good. Uh, well, uh, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a privilege for me to be here with Terry and Dave, these two luminaries on, on, uh, on the issue. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a privilege, and I want to call your attention to, to this point. You are all privileged. We are all privileged to live in the decade that will save the planet. So that's, that's what it is. You know, think about that. You could have uh, uh, been born in, I don't know, any, any time in the history. I mean, you, are, you were born during the decade that the planet will survive. So that's, I mean, no pressure, you know. So, <laughs> so you, you got to do it. You guys will do it. You know, I, I'm trying to do a little bit. You know, I, you know, I look like I am, I am 85, but I'm actually 120. So it's, uh, <coughs> you know, the <coughs> so it's, uh, first of all, it's a privilege to be part of, of this journey. Uh, and, uh, and I want to thank uh, the, the, the organizers and, and, the, and the Ross School uh, to inviting Boston Metal to be, to be part of this discussion. So <coughs> we... What we are doing is, is we are decarbonizing steel manufacturing. And if you, I mean, uh, I think the debate of uh, if eliminating CO2 or not is important, that's, that's over, right? So it's, uh, you know, it is, uh, we need to, to fix that. And the steel represents 10% of all the CO2 emitted in the world. So it's a big piece of the puzzle. And, uh, and that's what we are doing. We are using a technology called molten oxide electrolysis in order to solve that. Now, I'm going to zoom over steel making just to give some context of what, what steel is and how we are doing it today. So, so steel, you know, for millennia, so since the Iron Age, you manufacture steel the same way. You get iron ore mixed with coal, fire somehow, and, and get get your steel and, and emit uh, CO2. Problem is, now you are manufacturing two billion tons of steel per year. So it's lots of CO2, right? So for each ton of steel, you emit two tons of CO2. Right? So, so that's, that's the problem. <coughs> so you, you, have to, you have to fix that. Uh, now, Look, there is a person there in the middle of that thing. What do you think the average life of a person working on this thing would be, right? So I've got to fix that. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a neighborhood here in America. So there's people living close to this thing, right? So that's, that's how the, the incumbent is. I mean, it's, you can have a cleaner or dirtier, but in any case, one ton of steel, two tons of CO2, right? Very good. Now, the industry is already uh, pledging to be carbon neutral by 2050. That's not us, uh, Boston Metal. It's, it's the steel making companies. They're saying we are going to be carbon neutral by 2050. If that's true, then by the, the, the blast furnaces and the way that they do this thing today needs to be phased out by mid-30. And then once you do that, there are very few uh, ways to scale up to the two billion tons per year that is needed. I, I want to call your attention for this, this thing, the two billion tons. Like, like David said, you need to bend steel and you need to pour uh, concrete and, and cement. The next, the next metal after steel uh, is aluminum, and it's 70 million tons per year. So 2 billion tons, 70 million tons. So steel is and will continue to be the most important engineering material uh, available for several reasons. We don't need to go over here. But it's, it's not something that you, it's go, going away or, or you can replace it. it. There is no economy. There is no, nothing without steel. Everywhere you look, you got steel. So then you have to solve, and our technology can scale up. Even if you find a billion tons of scrap to remelt every year, 
which is very hard to do, uh, you will still need a billion and a half coming from our north. So it's a problem you need to solve. Now, the steel industry is regarded as very conservative, and, and they are, they may be, but it, historically, every time that you had a technology that was available, it was, and, and, and more efficient, it was adopted very fast. When the Bessemer came, you look at the curve there, it, it was adopted very fast, and, and every other one uh, the same. It, you know, the, the, the one today with the blast furnace was also adopted very fast. Now, the other important thing is this graph is the direct reduction. It's the, it's the direct reduction that it's in the left, uh, right cor uh, uh, corner of, of your graph. Uh, <coughs> so I, I, am, I am regarded to be lost. You know, people think I, I can get lost very fast. That's why I had to make sure. But anyway, uh, so direct reduction exists for more than 50 years and it never took off as a solution in the steel industry. There is a reason for that. There are, there are reasons why. You need very rich iron ore and you have lots of, of problems uh, associated with the process. So, <coughs> so uh, when you think of a solution like hydrogen for steel, uh, that's what this graph is showing. Only 3% of all the iron ore available would be able to be used in direct reduction without investing a lot in making the iron ore richer to use this technology, right? So the, the other graph there shows, uh, uh, you know, all those spots shown in the graph is, is iron ore with all sorts of, uh, you know, iron oxide composition that our technology already handles. The direct reduction you need to have a maximum amount of impurities and, and, uh, and a minimum amount of iron in the iron ore. So it's that very little uh, rectangle in the graph. So now, when there is a transition to go to carbon-free steel, and uh, during this transition, there are many ideas to improve, 5% here, 10%, 20% there. That's a, they're all valid. You have to improve as, you know, uh, as much as you can while you are in the journey, but, but you don't solve the whole problem. You need to go for the difficult thing, like Terry was saying and, and, and Dave mentioned, and in, if, if you want to solve the problem. Right? So this is a difficult problem to solve, and, and you need lots of resources, and, and, and that's, that's where we are. So here, you have the, the different ways uh, to manufacture steel. So the first one there is the incumbent, so you, you use blast furnace, BOF, uh, and, uh, and then, uh, then you have the push and shoveling that you have to do with hydrogen and direct reduction. Uh, then if you have scrap, you remelt the scrap, that's the easiest thing. And then our technology is a one-step technology. You put the iron ore in the cell, pass electricity, get your metal, right? So this is how it's done today, the incumbent. So you, you get iron ore needs to be pelletized or sintered, and then you have coal. You need a patio for coal. You go to a coking coal. You mix these two things on the top of the blast furnace. Blow air, get your pig iron. Put that thing in a torpedo car. Transfer that thing to a BOF. Blow oxygen to kill the excess carbon. And then you have your first steel. So that's how it is. That first steel goes to a lead of metallurgy, to a caster, to the rolling mills. So, so but, but all that stuff, until the BOF, our technology will replace, right? So, <coughs> blast furnaces, you know, they are the same all, you know, for all this time. So you have two pictures there. One is a, uh, a blast furnace in Pittsburgh. Uh, you can see it's in the 50s by the cars that are parked there in the, in, uh, you know, in, in the street. And, uh, <coughs> and the other one, it's, it's, a, it's a blast furnace in Japan today. It's a, it's a Nippon steel point. So it's, it's the blast furnace, right? It didn't change. Now, what our technology does, it takes the carbon out of the equation and put the electron there. So, so now, if, if the electricity is clean, you take care of scope one and scope two immediately, right? So, so that's how it is. And that's how it works. You have an electrolytic cell. 
in the electrolytic cell, you have a cathode, an anode, and an electrolyte. So, so the, the cathode is the metal itself. The electrolyte is a soup of oxides. And chemistry 101 likes dissolves the like. So you, you add iron ore, it's an oxide, in a soup of other oxides, it gets dissolved. Then you pass electricity. You need an anode to close the electricity. The electrons will do two things. It will heat everything, make everything liquid. So you separate the metal in the cathode from the electrolyte for density. And, uh, and it will also split the bonds of the least stable oxide, which in this case is the iron oxide by design. What, what, what are the other ones in the soup? It's silicon, aluminum, calcium, magnesia. So these guys are the impurities in the iron ore. So you can use any iron ore. So you don't need rich iron ore. So very simple, one step. So you, you add continuously your iron ore, pass electricity, collects the metal in the bottom of the cell. Once you get enough metal, you tap the cell. So the metal comes out and goes to the lead on metallurgy and to the caster the same way the, the, the incumbent steel will go. So <coughs> that's in, in a nutshell how, how the technology works, right? Now, the other thing I want to point out to you, a couple things, and, and that's where the fault comes, right? So in, in our case, it is a platform technology. And uh, if you have a soup of oxides in past electricity, you always split the bonds of the least stable. So you can use other metal systems there. So what we are doing is we have two fronts. We have the front of the green steel being developed. And in that case, we are in, in the pilot stage. And we are building the first multi-anode cell to demonstrate the technology in a semi-industrial level in Uber, Massachusetts, and this is going to be done this year, later in the year. The other is we are starting our first industrial production in Brazil, taking value from mining waste and slags. So you use uh, off-the-shelf anodes and you get raw material <coughs> that is a liability in balance sheets, take for a ride, pass through the cell, get the value, send back what is left with a check. What's wrong with that, right? So, and, and, and that's industrial. We will have the first facilities, a 10,000 ton uh, per year facility. We will start in the fourth quarter this year, and we will transform the company into a revenue company. So, so we graduate. This, this year, right? So, <coughs> uh, so very important. The other thing is the modularity of the process. So you, you don't need to grow the cell and the anode at the same time. So you need more metal, you add more cells. If you need uh, more metal per cell, you add more anodes in the cell. So once you develop the modular industrial anode, which is happening this year in, in, our, in, in, in our facility, you just replicate that, and, and you can build your industrial demonstration. Right? So I'm going to show you uh, the first step of green steel that happened uh, in our facility. So yes, for the most strange that it may seem, seem we are manufacturing steel in Boston. Right? So here you go. Here you go. So that's the, that's the single anode cell. And that's the steel being poured. So that sample that was taken there is on my shelf there. If you come to visit me, you see this one. <laughs> so and then and then we uh, uh, we commissioned a multi-anode cell in Woburn that is the industrial cell for our off-the-shelf anode plant in Brazil. So that's the first step in this big cell. It's a 25,000 ampere cell in this case.
So that gave us the confidence to start the business in Brazil, recovering value from slacks. So that's 1700 degrees C. So that, that metal is, is being poured out. And this is the plant in Brazil. So we, we, we beat the, uh, the Chinese kinetics. So and, and, and we built it in six months. So it's, uh, by the way, Happy New Year of the Dragon. So, so that's, that's, there you go. That's true. So that's, today. Yeah, yeah, that's today. Okay. Uh, so anyway, this, this is the, the plant that, that's the first phase. Uh, and, uh, and, and then there is another story here with this plant and with this, this foal, right? So that I think is going to touch everyone, if, if, you know, most of you, if not everyone. Uh, it's very nice to have a disruptive technology and build it in, in the outskirts of Boston. I mean, you have all the resources, you have all the talent. You have now, the other thing is you get that and you build in a very small city of 3,000 people in the, in the very countryside of, of one of the states in, in Brazil, and you transform. So that, with that, you prove that you can save the world, right? So that's, that's what it is. And, uh, and it's 100% green electricity over there. So even using off-the-shelf anodes for this plant, the product, our product will have a tenth of the carbon footprint of the incumbent today. So, so it's, a, it's a really uh, success story. Uh, this facility in Brazil will generate uh, uh, in the neighborhood of $400 million with more than $100 million uh, bottom line. Uh, and, uh, and the investment is $120 million. So. Tyler, uh, one thing I'd like to ask, would you consider this plan in Brazil your uh, demo plant, or this would be your focus? Well, it, it's, it's a bit of it, I would say. You know, this, uh, this plant uh, uses the molten oxide electrolysis technology for the first, first time in the industrial mm -hmm. uh, space. The only, we have everything proven for the technology in the industrial level, thermal balance, uh, uh, the rectifiers, bringing the electrons, uh, all the balance of plant, mm -hmm. all the refractories, everything is, is proven, except the inert node for the green steel, which we are finalizing the development here in, in Boston. So I think, I think it is a first of a kind for molten oxide electrolysis. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, uh, it's, it's also our, uh, a demonstrator, I would say. Yeah, so I, I think one thing I'd like to uh, highlight for the people attending is that there is no clear definition of focus. I would say it's a bit of a gray, fuzzy line on what is your first of a kind. Um, I have lots of startups coming to me talking about what their approach is, and is it a pilot? Is it really something you can scale to scale? And I think it's as this industry evolves and how each folk is treated <coughs> today, I, I just want to underline it. It's not something that can be defined that you can Google and what the, what the future is. Yeah, that's perfect. And then, uh, on a segue, Dave, what, what I, I say is, you know, the importance of this plant is, is, is the following. We are disrupting a multi-trillion dollar business. Mm -hmm. That's what the steel industry is, a multi-trillion dollar business, right? So you need resources. You're not going to do this with half a, uh, half a dozen dollars. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, this is, you know, you, so, so this plant brings sustainability. So when, if, when, when you are engaging in something that is very difficult and needs lots of resources. It's important to find a way to use that technology without being a distraction to make it more sustainable. And that's what it is. This is not a distraction. We are solving lots of the technological issues that we need, and we are bringing money because, you know, if, if otherwise it, you, you have to go to series D and E and F and G, and if you, so you, you it's very difficult to go get equity all the time, right? So. What, what problem did you tell your wife that got solved in that first unit that you were like, this is going to work? Yeah, well, it's, it, it, it solved two problems, right? It solved everything in the technology but the anode, and it solved the money problem. 
Yeah, okay. That's what Maybe I expect. That, you were through the gate. That's right. That's Everybody wanted to throw money at That's you. exactly. So <coughs> that's what it is. So I, this, look, this is a global business. Mm -hmm. This is not the high star, the multi-trillion dollar business that it brings to you, mm -hmm. but it's a global business. You have mining weight and, and slags and, and rejects all over the place. Right, so we bring in this here, we go in with this to Africa, and, and that, there is another thing with this technology. It, you know, mines that are not considered to be mined today because it's difficult yeah. to, uh, to recover, now becomes a resort, it becomes a, 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 a reserve, and it is mined all of a sudden. So we, we can use the technology in more than one way uh, in, in this case. Th there, is a, there is another component that uh, along the lines of getting resources to help. Uh, as, as, I, as you saw there, the, there is an anode in, in, the, in the green steel. That, that anode is the, is, is the key piece of, of the whole equipment. It's an inert anode. We call it inert because it doesn't participate in the reaction. It just closes the electricity passing in the cell. It's a chrome metal anode, chrome alloy. It was developed at MIT, patented, and we have the, the, the exclusive rights to use it. So we need chrome metal for our cell. So uh, then it got to a point where we would have to have a cost center to manufacture lots of uh, chrome metal anodes for our cells. So at that point, with the IRA and, and the mask program with uh, uh, Senator Manchin's uh, uh, bill, uh, we, we thought, well, look, if the U.S. imports 100% of the chrome metal that it uses, uh, there is no aircraft engine, no uh, oil and gas, no automotive, nothing without chrome metal, no defense. So, so what are we going to do is we are going to apply for a grant to build the first chrome metal plant in the US. 10,000 tons per year, supply the domestic market and get the chrome we need for our cells, right? So, so we are doing this. We, we were granted $50 million from the DOE to build a chrome metal plant in West Virginia. Uh, there were specific zip codes, so, so you're going to develop uh, uh, a depressed area from, uh, from, from the, the, the previous coal uh, uh, industry, and, uh, and uh, we will create uh, 250 high, highly paid jobs. Mm -hmm. We will produce 10,000 tons of chrome metal per year, uh, free the US from the imports for the important industry, and get the metal we need to sustain our development. So I think one thing that's I the story of the chrome. Yeah. I think the one thing I'd like to highlight is that, you know, Chad, you're obviously the experienced and professional CEO, but the one thing I've only realized meeting him today is that he's a, he's a, a, a master fundraiser, and that in order to do spokes, you need to build a war chest of capital, and a lot of this capital is blended capital. I think you raised money from the DOE, <coughs> you raised money from some of the biggest, most important metal companies in the world, some of the best venture capital firms, um, probably a few other entities I'm missing. Can you talk a little bit about this, like your financial journey that allowed you to build the balance sheet, to build a $100 million plant on balance sheet, and then how you raise all this capital? Sure. Now, it's, it, it was a very, very interesting journey. Uh, being a, a metals veteran and, and, and being associated to the steel industry, I, I mean, I had the, the CEOs of, of the, of most of the CEOs of the steel industry as friends and everything. So I, when, uh, when I thought I retired in December of 2016, and, and, and I was invited to, to join Boston Metals, uh, so my first thought was, well, I'm gonna go get one of my friends to put the money here and, and buy the thing. You know, I, I, I mean, this is so exciting. I couldn't say no to it. I said, well, beach can wait. And uh, uh, <laughs> so this cannot wait. So I, I'll go and convince one of them. And I, I went. And, uh, and that, that was too early for them. I, I was the number six in the company when I joined. Now we are more than 200. But, but when, I, when I joined, I, I, 
I went to visit them. And uh, six years ago, it was too early. Now, since a year, year and a half, they're all desperate, right? And they all uh, follow me. But, but anyway, then that was my first reality check, right? So then I thought, well, then, then it's going to go venture. Mm -hmm. And uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures were being formed, the, the Bill Gates and his uh, billionaire friend. So they led Series A. And uh, with the engine, uh, with Prelude Ventures and Rio GCI, so we got a very successful Series A, and then uh, and then we moved on, right, uh, uh, with with the milestones from so to to get to Series B. And when we got to Series B, uh, then a couple billionaires wanted to come in as as uh, strategics, but then we didn't want because then uh, you know that. That time passed for them to to write the whole check, right? So, so now they they wanted to come to buy the company for a check that was not big enough, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we needed 50 million. We ended up with 60 million mm -hmm. in the Series B, and uh, and I said, uh, and, and I said no to, to to important billionaires at that time. So then came Series, but, but then uh, one of them was in the iron ore industry. Uh, from Australia, and then and then he wanted to write the whole check. He said no, and then but but then but then we we let the largest mining company in BHP with Valley, the second largest, in a in a very controlled way, right? So no strings attached. Uh, and then and then we moved on to Series C. And now, uh, now. The one billionaire from the steel industry came and said, "What do I need to do to come in?" And, and, and it was a ditch and it all, and and and, uh, and we let them in, leading the the round, uh, no strings attached. So and then and then with that came uh, Aramco and came uh, NNG and, and came uh, you know the World Bank. I mean, this is this is another thing that it's that's we are very proud of. It was the the very first. Company that the, the the IFC the World Bank invested with equity mm -hmm. pre-revenue, so they are in our cap table. So we we ended up building a cap table that has 21 giants. No one controls the narrative, so we do what's the best for the company, and and still we have all these giants backing up our our journey. So it's it's a very it's, it's, it's a so good place to be. So when Breakthrough wrote the first check, what would you say to this group? You know, give them some insight. Um, did you convince Breakthrough that it was the amount of money to get the Brazil? Because you have a sort of, you said a three-handed business plan, different pieces. Were you selling the whole vision? Or were you saying, look, once I got that, once I show that thing done, the money's coming. I mean, what, what bet did they take? And what would you say to these guys for the, the companies they're looking at? That's uh, interesting. That's very, very important question. It, it's... The, the Series A was based on uh, getting to the higher value ferro alloys first, oh. not steel. And then because we were oversubscribed, then we started ah. the, the using the technology for steel right away. But, but the, the idea was, so when I arrived, uh, they were trying shooting all over the place, you know, trying all sorts of, of metal systems, titanium rare earths, and um, you can use the technology, it's a platform technology, but it wasn't the, the, the important, you know, the, the important, that's right, so you, you, you have to be focused, you have, you know, talent and resources are limited, you have to pick a bet, so if that's, you know, you, you will have, every one of you, you, you have to understand that, you can't, you know, and, and for technical people, especially like me, to say no to an elegant project is very <laughs> difficult, <laughs> very difficult. How can you say no to an elegant project, right? So it's about time that someone develops a process to substitute the crawl process to manufacture titanium, for example. So how can you say no to that? Well, it's because you have to lay the first egg. You have to, you have to pick a bet. So we picked the bet of the high value added ferro alloys. We sold Series A on that was oversubscribed, added the steel, and then, and then moved on. I think 
one of the things I think it's important to think about both is that it's a, it's a continuum and a transition is you go from your folks to your second in time, third of time, right? And you've done your first project on balance sheets. And you've all these strategics lined up that would be helpful to for your second, third projects that you maybe start doing off balance sheets and then you open yourself to the much bigger world of project finance and sovereign wealth funds. You can write much bigger checks but at a much lower cost of capital. But I think the one also thing to highlight is that you raise a lot of capital, right? Which is a sometimes a double-edged sword, is that you're getting a lot of capital, but if you raise several hundred million, you always get diluted. Mm -hmm. you know? How do you figure out that right balance between maximizing control, minimizing dilution, and still achieving your vision of building many, many um, like those Boston metal-powered plants? Yeah. Well, the, the Series C uh, it was a very interesting exercise. We, uh, you know, it, 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 it's circumstantial in a, in a sense as well. I mean, how, how much money you're going to get and what is the milestone that you design for that money? So the first idea in designing Series C was to go for half a billion. We were, we were uh, uh, leaving a time where, where we, we could see uh, money being deployed in a, in a much larger way. So I thought, well, I'm going to go for half a billion and get the money for the first demonstration plant as well, right? And then uh, the timing, when we went there, the timing was not right because it, it you know, all things started Which to time? come down. It was... Uh, market timing or uh, your development? It was the financial... Financial uh, market. Problem, yeah. Okay. That, that, uh, so it, it was... Uh, Late in 2022, early 2023, and and then and then things came down very quickly. Right, the so IRA sizzle was fa fa falling, yeah. and interest rates were coming up. Right, people were nervous. Exactly. So then, uh, all the funds, the big funds. I'm sorry to say this, right? But when you are 120 years old, you can say whatever you want, right? <laughs> so most of the big funds, they have no clue, you know. They the really like don't, us, you know. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, a, they, you know, they, these kids. They, I mean, they, I can tell you stories. They came and they made this, oh, this thorough due diligence and looked at everything and they said, oh, but I, I guess it's too early for us, or whatever, you know. And it's, uh, and then they invest in something that is totally, incredibly. Useless. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that's what it's ha it's happening. I you know, uh, I can tell you stories. You, you, and they're big, big what, guys. What grad I mean, school did they go to? Just I don't know. I mean, it is, <laughs> I mean, it's. Uh, I've been all over the world and talking to them, and they, they. I mean, some of them write letters to all the CEOs, and they have that arrogance to do these things, you know, and and then they they create all sorts of different funds and it's useless. They don't have a clue. So let me ask, the six people that were there before you, were they business people or were they science people out of the MIT labs? In other words, if you're <coughs> telling these people, scan and scout the best ideas, it's when, you know, your hiring was a major event. Um, were there business people there before you or were they all scientists? Uh, Just well, generally. yeah. Uh, mostly all scientists, that there was an angel that was a business person mm -hmm. uh, in the very beginning when the, f the company was formed. So the, the first angel was a business person. But, but, uh, it, it was but, but he was part of shooting all over the place to find where, where we stick. could find, where, where, where it would stick. Yeah. So, so you know, you know it, and uh, it, it is important to... Uh, to to analyze everything and, 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 and see what can what can scale and what look what is the question you want to answer that's what it is so you have to you have to have clarity in what is the problem you are trying to solve <laughs> if you are trying to solve decarbonizing steel for one steel company that's one problem if you are trying to solve decarbonizing the steel industry that's a two billion tons per year problem so they are two different problems. Right, so you it, and then you have to analyze the opportunity and the technology accordingly, right, to see if you 
if you go with or not. But I, anyway, this, the molten oxide electrolysis came out of MIT, Professor Sadway. Uh, it, it's, it's a very fascinating story, actually. I'll very quickly, I'll, I'll browse. It, he started, I mean, molten oxide electrolysis is known for a long time. And he was using that concept to solve the problem of inert anode in, in, uh, in the aluminum industry. And then uh, he got funded by NASA. See, what happened there, I don't know if you noticed, when you split the bonds of the oxide, you get your metal and you emit oxygen, right? So NASA was interested in the oxygen. So they said, well, let's bring the cell to the moon, get the dirt, the, the regolith, put it in the cell, run electricity coming from the panels that you build there, <laughs> and you get oxygen to extend stay, right? So he was funded for that, and he was doing it. In that case, wow. the, the, the anode was e e iridium, right? They said, well, oh, iridium, I mean, it's very expensive, right? So, uh, but if you go to the moon, everything is expensive anyway, so then <laughs> who cares, right? So, so then, then they, they did it. And that's then a must comment, incidentally. That's, that's a must comment? <laughs> OK, so there you go. So this guy's a genius. I mean, yeah. 10 years ago, you say this thing is going to go up and come down. It, you know, nobody would believe, right? Anyway, uh, so then the funded dried out and, uh, for, for that moon thing. And then he said, well, what if we look at the cathode instead? And, uh, but for that, you had to develop something that was not iridium, because then you wouldn't be, there is no iridium you know, available in order to do that. That's the first thing. Even if you go, if you forget the cost, you know how many tons of iridium per year is manufactured in the world? You, give me a number. Yeah. How many tons of iridium is manufactured in the world per year? Six, six tons. <laughs> I get, what's wrong with that? I get so you that. <laughs> now, <coughs> now there, you know, so you have to understand these things when you, you want, you have to do your homework and understand these things. You know, this, this is, you know, this people talking about uh, uh, manufacturing these billions of tons of hydrogen, you know, green hydrogen using proton exchange membrane. They use iridium there, you know? So you, you, you have to find where you're going to get your iridium. You know, where, where is the hydrogen? Can you see it? <laughs> I, I can't see it. So yeah, do your homework. You have to look at the whole equation. You know, and and uh, okay. so then they, they said, we need to develop a new anode. And that's alloy. the thing. Yeah. So they, they developed the chrome alloy. And, uh, and now we can manufacture metals you know, when there is lots of chrome, we are going to have our own chrome, and the rest of history. Can I ask you a question that I, I, for you guys should be really relevant? Like, if you look out at the world, the heavy metal production, for example, that can change the world, cement production, it's all out in remote places or already that capacity is in, installed. You made a brilliant, you know, a focused comment that, look, if, enter, if electricity at the right price at the right price is available, then you've got the moonshot. But without electricity at the right price at all the places where it needs to be that are relevant to decarbonizing a steel industry, this idea may not be one of the 10 that gets the leg because you do have competition out there. So how, how, you know, how do you, as someone who comes from the industry, I mean, you, you've just got a great, you, you gave us a great example about hydrogen. I mean. I'm sure many of these folks are, are excited about hydrogen, but the infrastructure problems around hydrogen are complex, and you've got to get underneath that first before you jump on the shooting star. I mean, is, is, uh, have you solved those shooting star problems now at Boston Metal, and now it's just big capital and deploying monster business plans against folk, and then you said soak, and then toke, you know? Yeah. No toke here, I uh, toke. <laughs> um, yeah, right. <laughs> how would you how would you advise them on that? Because that's a fundamental piece of them getting the first shot in their career right. Is no, not absolutely. getting on a dead end that's just not going to well, get Well, in, in in the case of of, of steel, we you know I, you saw the equation. We are decoupling 
uh, the problem, right? So the, the carbon as a reducing agent is going away. So we, we have electrons. Now you have to make sure that that electron is have to green. Be green. Yeah. So, but then, look, if you don't believe that electricity will be available, uh, abundant, green, and cheap, then forget it. But then, then you have to forget about everything else, right? So yeah. we need that for everything, including hydrogen, right? So uh, yes, your point is, is it, the, the bottleneck for this thing is availability of electricity. And, and for a million tons of steel per year, you need a base load 500 megawatts. Jeez. Which in, is in the middle of sometimes nowhere. Where, right. Now, you, you have places on Earth where you, where you have that already, right? So yep. in the Quebec, Scandinavia, Australia is investing a lot. Brazil may uh, come next. So it's, uh, it, it, you do. Here in the States, you have, right? So we, we've been approached by uh, electricity uh, providers and, and with, with a fixed price of less than $40 per megawatt hour. Uh, for 20 years, and green. So it, it, it's it's possible. Do you have enough for two billion tons per year? No, I don't think we we do. But but we have lots of investment in in other technologies, right? So you've got geothermal fusion will come one day, and then and then I just you know I I mean that's the I usually exaggerate uh, in an attempt to be didactic. I. I I believe, I don't know if I'm going to see this, but I, I believe that electricity one day will be free. So Zero point energy. Well, it, it will be so cheap that it's going to be useless to meter. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, that happened already in the past. So, so electricity will be cheap. We, I don't know how long it's going to take, but we are going to leave the carbon age. Make no mistake. But can, can I, one question I have is that we, so probably a few people here are working on their folks' business plans. I mean, they're going to create a fine tech business that's tackling a, a hard problem but with hardware. What advice would you give them as they're thinking about this to make their business plan folk native or folk enabled? Because you have a lot of benefits that a lot of people don't entrepreneurial community don't. You have this $2 billion track record. You raise all this capital, I mean, quite easily. How would you ask people who don't I'll have say, some of your advantages? I would say you, 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 have to, you have to sit down and design your milestones properly. Mm -hmm. That's, it's pretty obvious, right? But, but that's what it is. So you, you have a big problem to solve. How you, how you show progress. Mm -hmm. right? So how, how you divide your milestones and say, look, I need to get this, 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 and this, so if this is gonna cost this much. Then you prove that, then you de-risk that, and you, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you deliver, and then you go to the next one. I, I think understanding the problem and, and designing a, a clear path, uh, a timeline is, is very important. When, when you get the attention of, of investors uh, with what you are doing, uh, the next thing will be two things that they are going to, to be looking at. It's the team, who is going to do this, and, and the time, how long it's going to take. So, so it's very important to have a timeline. And that, and that for, for companies starting and coming out of the, the, uh, the university, sometimes it's, it's difficult to understand the importance of that, you know. Uh, I, I had a brilliant engineer uh, answer me. I said, when, when is this particular thing is going to be done? And, and he said, it will be done when it gets done. Right? So, <laughs> so I, I said, that's, that's, the guy's brilliant. He's still there. I love the guy. But it, it's tr the, the, this is an absolute wrong answer. Right? So it can't, can't be that way. Right? So, so uh, understanding the importance of timeline, designing the deliverables. And, and showing progress is, is very, very important. And, and by the way, talking about the talent, it's, it's the, the one thing that gave me the most gratitude you know, in, 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 the, in, in making the decision to uh, switch sunny Brazil for beautiful Boston was, 
was the you know the the ability to attract talent. You know, that's it's an amazing. I mean, we are 200 people now, and it's it's a heck of a talented group. You know, except for me, everyone is a champion there. So that's what it is. It's it's really 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 talented group, and that's very important. So. Didn't mean to break in, but you were answering some really good questions out of the Q and A, and so I've been checking some off as we've gone through. Um, just also for timekeeping for folks, we'll go another five or ten minutes, and then you'll get a quick break before the next panel. So um, I say this with a touch of hero worship. Thank you for for all the answers that you've given and and all these just amazing insights into what you've built. But I'll go through here and combine a few questions. So to start. Can you compare and contrast the role that government capital plays, either from a risk and a scaling perspective, with the role that strategic investments play in your capital stack? Well, uh, look, it's uh, uh, when you have a, a very difficult problem to solve, like decarbonizing the steel industry, th the government is super important. It's uh, first of all, it's a, it, you know. It, to, to think that this thing is going to be solved without government support, think again. It's, it, it will never happen. So it is super important. It's a, it's a completely different thing. So the, the strategic has a problem to solve, to continue, uh, to, 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 to continue uh, being profitable and returning to, to the investors and to the shareholders and and, and, and all that jazz. Well, the, the government has a, another problem to solve. You know, it's, there is a, a social aspect, there is development of communities, there is, it, it's a taxpayer money, it, it's, uh, it's the scrutiny is, a, it, it's, it's a different type of scrutiny. So, so you have to, you need both for big problems and you need to be prepared for, for both. So you, you have, you grow your company to a certain level, it gets to a point you, if you don't bring the controls and, uh, and, and, and all the, the paraphernalia that, that, that you have to, to show that you became a company, forget about it. You, you, you know, you, you're not going to get any more checks, right? Not from the strategic, not from government. So, so that, that is the, the, the one common denominator. You need, you need to have good controls, good governance once you get to a certain level. But they are different. Uh, they have different uh, horizons where they are, they are looking at, right? One thing I can say with that, as you're building your, your capital stack, it should be all the above. If you're truly being spoke at, at you know, bigger scale at Boston and Mellon is, then everything has to be decent. Yeah. Each of these investors, whether it be strategic, <coughs> private equity, government, have different risk tolerances and different cost of capital and different transaction costs. And most companies don't see strategic till Series C, just for the record, right? Right. So. Great segue over to the next question, which is, how have energy-focused VCs grappled with longer-term exits of folk investments? Do they simply ask for larger equity stakes, stack their equity stakes, or are there new innovative financing approaches? There you go, Dave. You were, you were, you, you, you were. I would <laughs> say um, a lot of the And I might add a specific example, just you know, put it in your toolbox. 
<clears throat> we have seen in, in California, clean tech, um, third states think Series C uh, preferred equity, but it has um, downside protection because the company wanted the big valuation, so they have downside protections to sweep cash flows or a priority payment in the case of liquidation. But on the back end, they have a clip against their multiple on invested capital, and they get capped out if they have conversion rights to equity. So we're seeing things like that, and you should be encouraged to use your creativity, right? If you want to add features to a traditional product that some old banker is telling you that doesn't work, you should say, why wouldn't we try that? Because I do think, to David's point, all these smart investors are trying to figure out how to, how to, how to solve the problems. And we know, generally speaking, really great ideas want to stay private longer because of bigger capital deployment. So, you know, we're seeing things like that for as a specific example. And, you know, that idea came out of a really young team at, at Marathon Capital out of San Francisco. And we, we printed a several hundred million dollar deal to one of the biggest automotive players in Europe, um, you know, who hadn't seen anything like it. So, you know, you can do whatever you want to do. You just have to say, hey, why not do that? There's nothing wrong with paying dividends, is there? Uh, that doesn't pay. It has accumulating dividends. Yeah. So, oh, I mean, right, nothing well, it's wrong with if it. If you right? are profitable, and you, you, you stay private longer. And, and that longer, kind of capital yeah, solved. So. David's problem is, you know, <coughs> with Prelude, for example, they have an infrastructure fund as well as an early stage fund. The early stage is invested in you, but I'm sure they have some infra money that wants to tag along when it gets really Ooh. easy, right? You can always do that, but you can also go to traditional investors and in private equity funds and make them put features that they haven't been looking at and, you know, sky's the limit for you guys and in, in how you solve those problems. And Breakthrough Energy Ventures also, yeah. Breakthrough Energy also has different funds, yeah. And I think that's where an insight to this is. There's no off-the-shelf uh, financing solution. Both of those growth equity, both of them are infrastructure, which really is that first piece. Are that few people like you in the audience to figure out what is that next piece of that fund look like? What value proposition? And and I give you a specific example: Lilac Solutions, a, a lithium producer. We looked at them in San Francisco. Um, I was there looking at the tubs and the little beads that were converting and absorbing and doing the chemistry. And we thought, well, that's going to be a science investment, and that's a licensing model, and how should that be capitalized? And we weren't sure about it. And Breakthrough Ventures came in and said, well, we're just going to throw a bunch of capital at this thing and go out, buy out, go out and buy all the land positions in Nevada and go ahead and do it ourselves and capture greater share of wallet because it's a better revenue play for, for our, as long as you throw enough capital at it, get the land grab early, turn it into an IPP development model, and, uh, you know, I can't tell you the number of times I, I see something one minute and go, wow, they went a different direction. Breakthrough took them there, which was, I wouldn't have ever predicted that. And again, sky's the limit on how, uh, I love how you said, it's you, you know, you guys are sitting in front of the most interesting decade we will have ever seen, which is why, you know, I'm not going to retire for a while. Good for you. Is, That's <laughs> fair. Right. It's too interesting. That's right. So I think we're right about at time. Are there any like 30 second last bits of advice you want to give before we wrap? Well, you're thinking, I'll say one thing. Yeah. Do me a favor, take your first job and stay in it for a long time and get some expertise. Don't bounce around, go deep, get knowledge, come up with some focus, right? It'll change your career, would be my view. Don't be too eager to move too quick. Get in and solve the hard problems because that'll make a difference. That, uh, uh, that's a good segue for me here. It's, uh, it's, I, I worked 40 years uh, at the same company. So you, you tend to learn a lot when you do that. Yeah. So I, I, I would say, uh, yeah, don't, don't give up. I mean, it's, uh, and, and don't, don't uh, I mean, stay, go out there, uh, you know, try new things and, uh, and, and be, uh, be adventurous. You know, it's, uh, and, uh, you know, for you students, uh, where you are today, I'm going to tell you, you are at the peak of your energy and uh, what you can offer. You know, you, you've learned and studied and, and you, you, 
you uh, digest so many cases and, and things. So it's going to be difficult to beat the level of energy uh, that, that you have today. So you, you have to take advantage of that and, uh, and shoot for the stars. So sky of, sky's the limit for you guys. So you uh, go do it. say this, that many people come to me and ask this question, how can I become a quantum mechanical engineer? <coughs> I think you should be a quantum mechanical engineer when you're 40. Go and become an operator, go become a government official, go be an astronaut, you develop a superpower. But there's your unique value add on helping the next generation test their potential. Very good. So I want to thank for being here again, you know, for inviting us. It's it's a, it's a true privilege to bring a, a Boston Metal example to, to this uh, very special audience. So thank you very much. Thank you. I would also like to thank Marcus. He's the one who made this happen. Absolutely. Everything. Yeah.